So welcome everyone. So glad to have you here. This is going to be a very special session. Um, it will be a mind bending session. Um, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Suji Tamara Mattis, DO, is a board certified family medicine physician. Um, not in the bio, but I should mention that Suji was uh, the founder of Sonoma County's Transgender Clinic. Just so you know. Um, I talk about that. Oh, you do? Okay, then never mind. I didn't say it. Um, Suji received <laughs> a certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and research from the California Institute for Integral Studies in 2018 and trained in ketamine assisted psychotherapy at the Polaris Insight Center. Suji has been the physician for the Sebastopol office of Evolve Mind Wellness since 2021. Evolve Mind Wellness offers psychedelic assisted psychotherapy in both California and Colorado. And in the interest of full disclosure, Suji is my co-parent and fellow householder. Suji, welcome. So good to have you here at last at one of our Tikkunim presenting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Now let's just hope the internet cooperates with us tonight. So uh, I'm Suji Tamar Mattis and I'm a board certified family medicine physician. Um, I've done a lot of things since I'm becoming a doctor. As Erwin said, I opened the first transgender clinic in Santa Rosa, it was in 2008 or 2009 and it's still running today. Um, I worked as a researcher for the Human Rights Watch. I was a physician at the homeless clinic for four years in Santa Rosa. And I've worked at the Sonoma County Indian Health uh, Project uh, delivering babies, just to name a few things. All of the populations that I've served have the same mental health issues in common. So mainly we see a lot of PTSD and depression. And, um, and I was getting really frustrated. I was getting very frustrated with the really poor outcomes of conventional treatments and the treatment options we have. Then I heard about the current research in psychedelic, uh, psychedelic medicine and all the amazing results that are being published. And I, I decided that this is where I wanted to practice. Um, so we're in the middle of what has been called the psychedelic renaissance. And I'm sure we've all heard about the healing potential of psychedelics. It's in the news like, several times a week. And every time I like turn on YouTube, Michael Pollan's there talking about it. Um, there's a lot of studies, so many studies have come out recently showing that psychedelics can help treat uh, depression, anxiety, OCD. Several new studies are showing good outcomes in the treatment of eating disorders. Ketamine has been shown to stop suicidal thoughts and MDMA assisted therapy can actually cure PTSD. But currently there's only one psychedelic that's legal at the federal level. This is just in the same way that cannabis has been working, that some states, and in the case of psychedelics, some counties have legalized or decriminalized some psychedelics, but the federal government can still arrest you for their possession or use. As a physician, my, uh, my DEA license, uh, my ability to prescribe medicine, that resides with the federal department um, of drugs. Uh, the, the DEA, the federal department that controls all drugs in uh, the United States. So if I were to be using um, any of these medications that are legal within like Oregon, I could actually lose my license to uh, prescribe. So right now, the only legal psychedelic that we have access to is ketamine. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about ketamine. It's very uh, popular these days. Uh, it was developed as an anesthetic. The funny thing about it is it's always had this very pesky little problem of causing people to have intense psychedelic trips, which is why often it, um, it's given with a medication called Versed, which makes people forget a lot about what has happened. But um, in the last 10 years, there's been a whole lot more research about ketamine specifically. And ketamine has been found to be a rapid acting antidepressant that can work even in cases of treatment resistant depression. And as I said, it can stop suicidal thoughts. It can actually do that pretty quickly within like a few weeks of treatment. Um, and it's also the only psychedelic that'll work even if you're taking antidepressants or many other um, psychiatric medications. Also, 
ketamine is a very, very strong psychedelic. I think it's actually one of the, it's up there in the top three of the strongest psychedelics in the world. It's also very safe. People do really well with it. There's very few poor outcomes with it. People um, tend to have um, relatively pleasant, sometimes intense, but relatively pleasant times. And otherwise it tends to be medically a very safe medicine. And of course it doesn't work for everyone, but when it works, it, it's pretty amazing. Um, so this is the medicine I work with. I'm the medical director at Evolve Mind Wellness in Sebastopol, where my job is to safely help people access the infinite universe and return to our usual reality. But it's not just that. My job is to make sure that people get high enough to be able to be in the other world, but not so high that they can't remember the important information that they experienced there. We want people to remember what they saw and experienced and bring it back so they can work with a therapist to help resolve the deep issues that they're there to work on. And that's my job. That's my job every day. So tonight we're gonna to talk about, actually tonight we've been asked to talk about the slow reveal. How does the universe and the divine flow through us? And I would add, how do we flow through it? My talk is titled, More Real Than Real, The Mikvah of Psychedelics. And I'd like to talk about how psychedelics can help humans experience the universe or the divine flowing through them and become it. So there's many, many ways to access God or oneness with the universe. You know, prayer, meditation, deep study of sacred texts, even performing a mitzvah can, can get you into the state. You know, sometimes I can actually touch the edge of this experience with a deeply exhaled Shema set in unison with others. And psychedelics can be one of these pathways. I think we all know that psychedelics give people mystical experiences. And currently there are many research papers that show that the mystical experience is important to the positive healing outcomes of psychedelic treatment. You know, there's some companies that are trying to make psychedelics that don't cause the psychedelic experience and those companies are beginning to fail and close. So it does seem that the actual mystical psychedelic effect is an important part of the treatment. The mystical experience is so important that uh, for research purposes uh, there's now a mystical experience questionnaire, so you can measure this, so you can actually write it up in scientific paper. Let's talk about the three aspects of the mystical experience. One is the sense of unity. It's a feeling of belonging in the world and of a connectedness to other people, creatures, or, or even the universe. Number two is a sense of sacredness, and this can be felt as an overwhelming sense of preciousness about this experience or about the the space you're in, or it can also be a feeling of a direct experience of God. And the third one is the noetic sense. And this is a deep feeling that the experience is authoritatively true, that it feels more true than normal waking consciousness, or the feeling that an experience is more real than real. In the same way that not every prayer or meditation practice leads to a profound change or healing, not every journey with psychedelics does either. And this is specifically true, or especially true, if you've not prepared for that experience. Rabbi Art Green says it this way. And incidentally, Rabbi Art Green's first acid trip was in 1965 with Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, who you may know later became Ron Das. So she had a a lot more experience with psychedelics after that and has some very interesting things to say. So he says specifically about this, that there's a chemical component to what we call mystical experience. If that happens in the brain with psychedelics, I don't see anything inauthentic about that. The problem is that if someone has that experience after 20 years of meditation, there's a certain gravitas to that experience. If you pop a pill and have that experience, you don't understand what happened or have that gravitas. You don't have the tools to approach it. 
perspective to integrate it into your life. But that doesn't make the experience itself inauthentic. It means that the context in which it takes place is a less serious context. So here he's saying two very important things. One, that he feels psychedelics are a legitimate path to mystical experience, which many people do. And two, if you don't have the right preparation, you'll not be able to integrate that experience into your life and you will not get the deep change that you're looking for. So this preparation is what we call set and setting in psychedelic medicine. The set is the person's mindset that they come in with to take the medicine. And we have people form an intention about for what they're about to do. So it could be something like, um, I, I'd like to have a healthier relationship with my, my mother, or I would like to be less anxious. It can be very simple. Um, the setting is how the physical space feels. It should be calming, there should be few distractions, and it should help the person feel safe. Research shows that people get better outcomes from a psychedelic treatment if the set and setting are carefully considered and implemented. In Judaism, there are many things that we do to establish the setting for a religious event. There is attention to the space, there is maybe fasting together or the ritual of lighting candles, even the weekly ritual of the day of rest. There's the ritual to how we read the Torah, incorporating prayers and actions. All of these are here to give us the setting for an experience of the divine. And we have a specific name for the set, that intention that helps us concentrate our mind on the prayer or the action. The word is kavana. It is a kavana or the intention that makes that act holy. And it is the intention that makes the psychedelic work for healing. When I'm working with psychedelics, I often think of the ritual of the mikvah, the intention of immersing in the living water. I think we often just think of the mikvah for its use in purification, but the mikvah is a powerful experience of dissolving into the divine. Rabbi Erwin Keller explains how the mikvah does this. Talmud tells us that part, one part in 60 is the proper proportion of something to become nullified. If a drop of milk falls in the meat soup, it lets go of its nature and becomes one with the soup and kosher, as long as the soup is at least 60 times the volume of the drop of milk. So 60 to one is the ratio of the tool or of nullification, of dissolving, of transforming. The, he then quotes some intense gematria from the Rebbe known as the B'nai Yisachar that reaches the conclusion that the amount of living water in the mikvah is 60 times the volume of the self. And the Rebbe uses this to demonstrate that in the mikvah, we dissolve back into the infinite of, of God. We are nullified. We lose ourselves in this divine soup. In the poem, Prelude to Mikvah, Cynthia Wallace describes the experience of the mikvah, of the mikvah as, a, as a dissolving. Naked and alone, I approach the mikvah nothing between my body and the warm flowing waters. I pull my knees to my chest, head curled down, a fetal position, the shape of the human heart. Water touches my every cell. The borders of my body become indistinguishable from the molecules of sacred water. As one together, yet cradled and enveloped by a profound embrace. Hashem that is the water, water that is Hashem, nourished in his womb, that is her womb, that is the womb of the people of Israel. Stepping out, I, cher I cherish the feeling of pressure, the water's indelible imprint on my skin, the comfort of being completely enveloped and sustained, the joy of feeling at one within myself, held within Hashem, Hashem who is, is, was, is, is, 
is always will be, is breath, is truth. Personally, I believe that these experiences are how we begin to remember who we are. There is no dichotomy. I think we get stuck in these ideas of separation and disconnection. But the truth is that there's no mind-body difference. There is no God and human separation. By Green describes the non-duality of the psychedelic experience this way. There is only one ultimate reality. There isn't God and the world and God and the self. There is one ultimate reality and we are part of it. Each of us is here for a tiny flick in an evolutionary time. We do what we do, but we are all part of this greater process. We see the world, of course, from the point of view of our own individual self, but there is a way to get into the mind of that one since we are all part of that one, into the mind of that one in the psychedelic experience, there's a way to see the world from the mind of God. I think that when we, do, when we dissolve in the mikvah of psychedelics, we begin to remember, to remember that we are all part of the same energy that is the essence of life and that we have simply forgotten who we are, that we are all sacred, that we are all beautiful, that we are all love, that we are all God. <sighs> okay, I am... Um opening up to take questions at this point. If anybody has anything they want to say or anything they want to ask. Just give us a moment to catch our breath. If folks would like to go ahead and unmute and ask questions, feel free. Adam? Yes. Um, thank you so much. That was, and yeah, catch our breath. Um, that was beautifully explicated. And um, I'm, I'm curious, and it's a question I've had before, um, about, um, and tell me if this is going too specific too quickly, about... Um, <laughs> about Jewish rituals for set and setting in the psychedelic context. Mm -hmm. That, that ways to, ways to bring it into, um, I mean, not, not everything needs to be in a specifically Jewish context, but that, that could, that I can imagine a con situations where that could be a useful thing to have it be a specifically Jewish set and set, a set and setting with that. And just thoughts on that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that any um, any type of setting for, for ritual and Judaism could be translated into, into psychedelics, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, definitely, I mean, def I think the Shema is really an important one that mm -hmm. I think you could sit and just chant the Shema with a group of people as you go into a psychedelic experience and have quite an amazing time. Um, and I think that, that a lot of the other prayers would work for that as well. And, and a lot of the settings would work for that as well as you know, candle lighting, um, turning off any, you know, not observing sort of the Sabbath rules, right? So giving yourself that space out of time to take to take this space out of time where you're not going to answer the phone, you're not going to be using electronics, and and have that be the space where you're um, you're having this experience. There's a lot of ways to make this a very uh, Jewish experience as well. Thank you, Alyssa. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Suji. That was wonderful. Um, 
So two, two comments. One, just responding to Adam, um, people might be interested in the work of Shefa and Rabbi Zach Kamenetz because he's specifically working on integrating um, Jew, Jewish practice with psychedelics. And he has his, Shefa has a lot of ideas, more additional ideas. Um, Suji's were wonderful as well. Um, and I also just wanted to comment, I guess, as someone um, who's had my own psychedelic experiences and also who, who works as a guide and therapist with uh, psychedelic assisted therapy, that um, what's most challenging for me and for people I work with is trying to integrate the sacred experiences, the, the numinous mystical experiences they have on psychedelics into their daily life. And so I'd be curious about any comments, you know, about that. And, and I think also, I mean, in my own experimenting with this, I think that Jewish practices actually for me have really um, helped to make that transition. And, and you know, um, I also can see more meaning in certain practices after some of the mystical experiences I've had in psychedelics. So just any thoughts about that? I think in, in, in Western society, we're very anti-mystical these days, or we're anti having direct experiences of divine um, nature. And, um, but I think that when you're working with psychedelics a lot, you really get this feeling. I mean, it is this funny thing that you carry with you all the time. And if you talk to people who do really intensive Buddhist uh, meditation practice, it doesn't require many, many years, they also understand this, that you have the sense, you know that you are the small uh, creature on this earth. You're a small, fragile, very momentary, as Rabbi Green says, creature on this earth, but you're not that, right? You're this much bigger being. You're, you're much bigger than you think you are. And with uh, either intensive meditation or with um, psychedelics or other mystical experiences, you get that, that sense. And I, I think one of the things I really appreciate about working with ketamine is it, it does a lot of really wonderful things. When it calms down the amygdala, which is the fear and anxiety centers of the brain. So it's one of the kindest psychedelics in the world. And it really pulls people way out of themselves and gives them that perspective of who, who it gives you the perspective of who you are in the universe. And in many ways, I think that's where you get most of that you get most of that healing from when you realize that all this stuff that you're thinking is so important isn't that important because you're so much bigger than all that. And that's where a lot of issues tend to really just resolve or fall away. Um, and just helping people to hold that feeling that, yeah, we're here and we're doing this thing and like you're like you know, making your coffee or whatever, but that's just not all of who you are. So reminding people that that's your, this is just what we think we are and we just can't forget that, that we are all the rest of this. That I think is the most important thing that we do when we're working with people to integrate their experiences and to continue that, that process of um, finding that healing. Shoshana? Yes, I'm going to put something in the chat that I um, left out of my presentation, but it, it feels so relevant here. So these are these ancient cult stands from 9th century BCE. I know, Alyssa, you talked a little bit about this last year, but they're finding, I'm just going to read, scientific analysis shows that the vast number of vessels that were deposited as cult objects in this archaeological find from ancient Israel in the ninth century BCE contains substances that the ancient population of Yavne would have used to induce hallucinations. So, you know, I, I think it really raises how much of the mystical experiences, how much of the biblical text itself comes from people having these profound mystical experiences sounds like facilitated by psychedelic substances. I mean, it's really, 
profound that, you know, I mean, just that question of how, how are these two related or are religious, um, you know, that it is maybe very deeply interwoven into our text. And anyway, just wanted to. Yeah, I think, I think the, the really interesting part in there is that there's already this, like these, it's already a part of the brain that's set up to have this ability to have those mystical experiences, right? And whether it's, it's chemically induced by, I mean, it's all basically chemically induced, but it's induced by taking or eating bread that has the right mold in it or by taking a, a substance, or if it's induced by just having this like intense realization, um, as you know, you'll see in like Zen Buddhism that you you think you're, you're like meditating, meditating, and then boom, you have that intense re revelation of where you are in the world and and you're seeing the whole picture and the more real than real part of the picture. Or, I mean, you can look at um, um, at the, uh, the the mystical rabbis where they're they're studying and intensely studying the the texts. And that will bring them this mystical experience. But the important thing is, there's already something in a human brain that's set up to have that that connection to the infinite, and and that I think is a really fascinating thing. Mm. Thank you, um, Amy. You're off camera, but you're next. Great, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I could go off cam on camera, but it might be a little scary. Um, it's up to you. I just want to make sure you knew. Yeah, thanks. Um, Suji, I really appreciate all this. I've been thinking about uh, psychedelics for a couple of years um, and more intensely in the last couple months. And I've spoken to three different people and um, was just left with more confusion and more uncertainty. And after tonight, I feel like so grounded about it <laughs> from just hearing you. Um, but my question is, talk about set and setting. And it makes me think of, you know, like ready, set, go. And so I feel ready and committed and curious. And then the set part, um how do you know if you're set <laughs> and how do you know when to press go mm -hmm. um where you know when how do you know? <laughs> whatever work you're doing psychologically or spiritually or you know space traveling or whatever um i'm not I'm not sure if there's a if there's an indicate an indicator or a flashing green light, you know, that says, okay, she's ready. And I'm wondering what your thoughts right. are about that. You know, um, in a lot of plant medicine based um, uh, schools of thought um, or cultures or um, practitioners, you you really tell people that they should do it if they feel called to do it, right? So if you feel the calling to, to go to, to do it, that you know uh, when you find the right person and the right people to do it with, that's when you know you're ready. And, um, you know, you just have to listen to your heart in this, I believe, and, and follow your intuition for when it's the right time. And the people that you feel safe with too, all right? The right people, the right time, the right place, all of those have to feel safe. Yeah, uh, and I imagine feeling comfortable in the setting helps you feel set. And for, you know, any wild cards that might occur, like, because you don't know, right? Or I oh, would. Yeah. You never know. Right, you never know, right? What you're gonna, I mean, you have an intention. And we always tell people, you know, when you go into the medicine, you hold that intention very lightly, because whatever your whatever your inner healer or whatever you want to call it is bringing up for you in that particular particular session is what you're going to need to um, to feel to is what you're what you're going to need, right? The inter internal healer is really what's 
doing the healing. So, um, and being with people who are really well trained to work with whatever comes up is the other part of that. Um, and I think that's, those are the two important things. Um, people are starting to stack up circling over the airport here. Um, including oh. me, I have a question too, but we'll start with Robin and then Carol. Yeah, hi, Suji. Uh, in the uh, late 60s, I got the chance to do uh, uh, whatever that was. <laughs> and I somehow, I didn't know I was had an autistic brain then, but it was nevertheless working. And I prepared the best I could, and I actually had two really incredibly good experiences. But I'm wondering if you have run into any particular difference if you knew people had autistic brains? Um, you know, it's actually amazing. There's so there's a lot of research going on right now with uh, autism and, and um, uh, in psychedelic um, treatments, uh, especially with MDMA. My um, preceptor in the CIS program, that was her research uh, area, was working with uh, people who with high functioning autism and seeing if you could get more ability to feel comfortable in the world by using MDMA and by doing MDMA treatment. Um, it was really, it was very interesting. It was a really interesting um, outcomes. People did seem to do really well. People had some very useful insights. Uh, in my clinic, we've seen plenty of people who are high functioning autistic, um, uh, have, have high functioning autistic brains and they do incredibly well with the medicine. So yeah, it is, it is a really new part of study and, and it is our study in psychedelics. And I think it's gonna, as we go along, it's gonna show much, much more um, promise. So I definitely keep your ears open for that. Yeah. Carol. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, Suji. Really um, helpful to hear what you had to say. Um, I have a disclosure here. I am a sober alcoholic. What would you say about the appropriateness of the use of psychedelics um, by alcoholics and drug addicts? Mm -hmm. Um, psychedelics have had incredibly great results in getting people off of uh, drugs and alcohol. Um, there are many really excellent studies about this. Uh, when I started looking, personally, when I started looking at working with, with ketamine, my biggest fear was, well, don't people get addicted to ketamine? But in all the research that's been done, there's been not a single case of anyone becoming addicted to ketamine in a clinical situation, um, in, a, in clinical use. I've also, you know, personally in our clinic, I have seen many people stop drinking. Oh, oops, back up first and say, we do not do drug and alcohol specific work because we're none of us are, are um, there's certain uh, specific, um, certifications you have to do to do that or to have to have to do that. So we don't we don't do that, but we see people who do have drug and alcohol abuse for their PTSD or their depression and for other things. But along with that, people have these amazing um, experiences of they will stop drinking or they'll stop using um, whatever drugs. Had two people recently completely become clean and sober of meth. Uh, one of our patients in the middle of like a psychedelic experience uh, actually broke up with meth and he was having a really hard time with it. And he actually talked to meth and was like, hey, it's like, hey, buddy, you know, you've been really great. You've been there for me. I really appreciate it. But now you're like, I, I, you're screwing my life up and I can't have you anymore. And you just, you gotta go, I'm sorry. And it's been, I think it's been five months now. He's been clean and sober of everything. Um, so the psychedelics don't, uh, psychedelics do have this ability to change people's minds in that way and move that ability, that, that desire for <clears throat> addictive substances. Uh, this is also true, they did, gosh, it was 2015, they did this really amazing study with psilocybin and people who were uh, using nicotine. Nicotine is one of the hardest 
drugs to get off of. I've had plenty of heroin addicts say that kicking heroin, so much easier than kicking nicotine. So they took a whole bunch of people who were heavy smokers. They treated them with um, psilocybin in the basic, you know, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy sort of model. I think, I believe in that study, they did three psilocybin experiences. And then somewhere between 60 and 68% of their cohort became completely sober um, or became completely absent of nicotine. And they followed them up for five years. And at five years, a good 40 to 50% of those people still had not gone back to nicotine, which doesn't sound great. But if you consider that any other treatment for nicotine addiction we have has maybe five to 10% success rate. So this is huge. I mean, that was just an amazing, amazing example of how well psychedelics can work for, for these addictive behaviors. Eileen and then Allie. Eileen? Well, hi. Um, so as some of you know, I was an old hippie. I was one of the early hippies and I experimented with all the psychedelics early, early on um, without any guidance at all, um, but was profoundly changed by them anyway. I, I really salute you and Alyssa and people that are working with people on psychedelics because I think that probably I could have moved forward a lot more if I had had that integration. Um, though I, I do have this profound, deep spirituality that uh, I received from the experiences. So I don't have the, the words of it, of what happened to me. Um, but I have it at a body felt level. So I'm grateful for that. Um, one thing that we always did, people that I knew about, was was do psychedelics in nature. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing it in a room with the blindfolds on and 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 all that. You know, it just seems so restrictive. It was it was so much part of the spiritual experience was to be somewhere alone in nature with just one other person. And I just wonder what what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, and I do know for a lot of people, being out in a natural setting is really is really a powerful part of the experience. Um, I would say though that I think um, I think that if you did it at this point and had the the blindfold on and were like really, I mean, it really gives you this much more internalized experience that you're able to get super super deep where you can't always do that if your eyes are open. You're taking in the um, the simulation of like the the visual context around you. So when you when you when you close that part off, you're really communicating internally with the deep the deep stuff that comes up. And and specifically, I'd say for for ketamine, it really removes your ability to see very clearly or your ability to to modulate the the signals from your eyes back into your brain. It kind of gets a little wonky, and so you're not going to be seeing very clearly or very sharply anyway. And so really, and especially for ketamine also, it's a very internalized experience. It, you really are in a different place. You're, you're in a diff, completely different world. You're not in your body. Um, I often will tell patients uh, before we start, before we start the ketamine, it's that you know, it's, you, if you get the chance to leave your body, please just feel free to go ahead and don't worry. It's our job to watch over your body and keep you safe while you're gone. And I think that also allows people to really be able to let go and to go and experience those incredibly deep places. Allie? I, first of all, thank you, Suji. Um, and I was really interested in what you had to say about set and setting and wanted to know if, um, you could say more about that. And I guess I should preface it by saying that my, my idea of set had always been set in terms of like, I guess I'd imagine set as like a, 
a movie theater set or a play and like you're setting a stage sort of thing. And then I've interpreted the setting part of that as being the people who are around, what I'm doing with those people, what we're listening to, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, yeah, just know if you hear more of your thoughts on set and setting, because I thought that you had more to add to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yes, that is definitely the, the internal part, right? And the setting is the external. And so, um, and this is like kind of an important thing. So you, you'll hear, I'm sure everybody's heard about bad trips and, and bad trips kind of happen mostly when you're not looking at set and setting. Like maybe your people have just like decided to like their friends show up and they've got some acid and they just take this hit of acid, not really thinking about why they're doing it or the fact that this is all going to be a very intense time and, and then maybe go out to a concert or something. And that, that is definitely where you're going to end up having more of these, these more intense issues because you're not really like thinking about why am I taking this medicine? What's, you know, what's my purpose here? And then you're not controlling your environment to make it a safe and, and supportive place, right? So that's that's the important part of set and setting. That if you aren't paying attention to that, then you could be in a place where your your anxiety is really going to come up, which is what mostly bad trips are. Bad trips aren't a, bad trips aren't a really um, mysterious thing. It's just that if you are in a place where you're not comfortable and you're in uh, in a physical place where you're not comfortable or feeling safe and then you're very altered internally, it's gonna be really hard to, to make everything sort of flow properly. And that causes a lot of anxiety and that's, that's what comes up in there. We, um, in our clinic, we'll, we don't see bad trips. We see sometimes people get into some very difficult situations and we work with people who have pretty severe histories of trauma. And so sometimes people will get back into those places and, and it can cause some anxiety, even with the, the ketamine decreasing the amygdala uh, um, energy, like decreasing the, the anxiety, ability to have anxiety. And the important part about that is being well-trained and having the people that are well-trained with you to be able to talk through that and to be able to help you through that. Um, it is usually a place in, um, psychedelic assisted psychotherapy where you get really intensely rich material and you get very, very deep healing. So sometimes those really intense moments are quite amazing and very fruitful in if you are in the, the right set and setting. So Suji, <clears throat> I'd like to come back to the question of prophecy. Mm -hmm. uh, topic this evening. You were talking about the noetic element, the noetic dimension of the psychedelic experience, or maybe particularly the ketamine experience. No, any psychedelic. Any psychedelic. Uh, the truthiness of it. And um, I did, I've did. i done one ketamine journey with you um, and a little bit of other psychedelics, but not a lot. But I had a very different sense of the truthiness in the ketamine journey. Um, and so when you were saying, it's the sense that this is realer than real. Mm -hmm. My question is, <laughs> is it that because it is realer than real? Or is that because uh, through the process of the drug, uh, we receive it as realer than real? So I, my question for you then is what is your, you know, and, and any, any prophetic moment can raise that question, right? Whether it's in your dreams or whether it's in, you know, a voice um, that you hear. And uh, undoubtedly, our ancestors ask that question all the time, too. So my question for you about, about psychedelics is, to what degree is this opening you up to a kind of communication? Um, or to what degree is it opening you up to um, uh, an, a, a deep intuition or a deep knowing? And for you, is there a difference? Hmm. Um, you know, that's a good question. I think part of what, how I think of it is that as, um, as humans, you know, we are trapped in these, these physical bodies and we don't always have access to these higher planes, right? And however, we can get that access. And once again, you know, 
deep and intensive and long-term meditation will get you that access and will get you into that situation where things are more real than real. And also anybody who has these intense, like ecstatic experiences can also get in those same places. Um, so I think that, yeah, I, I do personally think that that is that more real than real feeling that is glimpsing um, a different way to use your brain to be able to see like the bigger picture. So much of our, our brain is like filtering out a lot of what our senses are giving us so that we can uh, function, so that everything moves smoothly, so that you know you can catch a ball and you can drive a car and all that stuff. And when you start moving beyond that very sort of simplistic animalistic part of the brain into like some higher levels of, of allowing all these new connections to happen, then you're able, different parts of your brain can communicate to each, to each other. And then you're really able to um, see what's real. And I think that's a lot of what happens. Incidentally, you'll, you'll find this if you look up, um, uh, there's two things that all psychedelics have in common in the way they affect the brain. And that is um, something called um, uh, neurogenesis and um, what's the other one? neuroplasticity, sorry. Neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. You know, like I don't say this every day, which I do. So the neurogenesis is you're actually, psychedelics actually cause brain cells to form, like to grow. You get new brain cells from doing psychedelics. The other part of that is you actually get new endings on those brain cells. You get a lot more junctions on your brain cells. And that's neurogenesis, the causing of, of brain cells to grow. The other thing that all psychedelics do is they cause uh, neuroplasticity. And that means that you're beginning to get all these new connections between different parts of your brain. So you get these new pathways, which we think is why it works for so many different things like depression and PTSD and and uh, drug addiction is that you're becoming, you're getting all these new pathways and all these different parts of your brain are beginning to talk to each other in ways that don't. So you are getting a new perception of what is actually real and not filtered by what needs to be filtered. And this is my opinion, you know, I'm sure if you like talk to people who are more studied in the neurosciences, they'll come up with a lot of different um, ideas, but this is definitely one of those ideas out there. And this one just seems to be right to me. Um, yeah, it felt to me so truthy that like my heart would burst, like I couldn't even contain the 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 realness, the the bigness of the realness. Um, and I've been, and I continue to hold it. You know, I continue to hold this, and that I don't know how long ago that was. Seven months? No, it was more than it was maybe a year ago, yeah. almost a year ago, and I still can slip into that appreciation and awareness of um, all the things that I perceived that I, I really felt like I was perceiving. I didn't feel like I would, with, you know, other, um, um, with other psychedelics, I've sometimes had the feeling that, oh, wow, look at the vision I'm having. Right. Whereas this, it felt like perception rather than imagination in some way. And, and I think some of that too is a is a matter of dosage too, right? Because if you take a lower dose, you're not gonna of any psychedelic, you're not gonna have that that's very deep experience. So it's a dose dependent issue, which is the same if you want to think about uh, meditation as well, right? That's also a dose dependent issue. If you meditate for twenty minutes a day, you're gonna have a lot of positive effects to your to your you know mind and body, but if you meditate, but you're not going to get that experience, right? If you meditate eight hours a day for, you know, 10 years, that's going to give you that effect. Like that, that is an increased dose of meditation. that's going to put you into that place where you're able to see and have all those connections in your brain. Our time is kind of up. Um, thank you for this really wonderful opportunity to explore um, the ins and outs of the medicine and the healing and the um, and the prophecy in it. Is there anything you want to say to to close for us? Um, you know, I would just say it, it once again, it, it, you don't have to use psychedelics to get to this place just to take 
time to look at everything in your life and and see what is beyond just what you're seeing and look for look with your heart and try and and follow that and see what's really there hmm. well for staying up so late tonight to listen to <laughs> Thank you so much, Suji, um, on behalf Safe of all travels. of us. Wonderful. Safe travels, everyone. So uh, we have uh, nine minutes of turnaround. If you're gonna, if you're gonna stay on, um, we move into just one session in the main room coming up, and that's uh, I'll be teaching about the uh, the Talmud about prophecy and dreams. Okay. So I'll look forward to seeing you in there. If if you're dropping off now sweet dreams have have revelation in your dreams while we're talking about revelation in dreams and i look forward to seeing many of you tomorrow <laughs>